Hello from the World Economic Forum in Geneva. My name is Adrian Monk and I'll be moderating today's session. Welcome to this virtual meeting which has brought together leaders and stakeholders from across the global community for our COVID action platform. Today, this meeting serves as a launch pad for the next chapter, The Great Reset. We have contributions from His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, from UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, from IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva, and from many more in the next hour and a quarter. But to get us underway, let's hear from the forum's executive chairman and founder, Professor Klaus Schwab. Thank you, Adrian. It is obvious that we are in the midst of the most severe crisis the world has experienced since World War II. 75 years ago, countries and people came together to shape the post-war global order, which brought us decades of peace, increased global cooperation and prosperity to hundreds of millions of people around the world. The COVID-19 crisis has shown us that our old systems are not fit anymore for the 21st century. It has laid bare the fundamental lack of social cohesion, fairness, inclusion, and equality. Now is the historical moment, the time, not only to fight severe virus, but to shape the system for the need for the post-corona era. We have a choice to remain passive, which would lead to, an, to the amplification of many of the trends we see today. Polarization, nationalism, racism, and ultimately increased social unrest and conflicts. But we have another choice. We can build a new social contract particularly integrating the next generation. We can change our behavior to be in harmony with nature again. And we can make sure that the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution are best utilized to provide us with better lives. In short, we need a great reset. We have to mobilize all constituents of our global society to work together. We must not miss this unique window of opportunity. For this reason, I'm grateful that we are joined for this announcement of the Great Reset Initiative, not only by His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, but by representatives of international organizations, business, trade unions, scientists, and above all, the young generation. Now we have the very special message from the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. Your Royal Highness, Professor Schwab, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I send you my warmest greetings and best wishes on the launch of the Great Reset. The COVID-19 pandemic is causing enormous human suffering and economic hardship. A microscopic virus has closed down entire countries and economies. In doing so, it has exposed the fragility that characterizes much of our world. But this fragility is not confined to health systems. Runaway climate change, unsustainable levels of inequality, and the lawlessness of cyberspace are all warning signs that we must heed. The Great Reset is a welcome recognition that this human tragedy must be a wake-up call. As you rightly say, it is imperative that we reimagine, rebuild, redesign, reinvigorate, and rebalance our world. The scale of the pandemic and its social and economic impact demand strong unity and solidarity, particularly towards developing countries. Specific measures must be targeted at those most affected, women, older people, youth, low-wage workers, the informal sector, and people caught up in humanitarian crises. Rebalancing investment, harnessing science and technology, and advancing the transition to net zero emissions, all elements of the Great Reset are fundamental to building the future we need. We have already called for an economic stimulus package equivalent to a double digit percentage, more than 10% of the global economy. Last week, the United Nations together with the governments of Jamaica and Canada 
convened the largest gathering of world leaders since the start of the pandemic to lay solid foundations for a sustainable recovery based on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Agreement. We must build more equal, inclusive and sustainable economies and societies that are more resilient in the face of pandemics, climate change and the many other global challenges we face. As momentum builds for a fairer and more inclusive recovery, the Great Reset can help to enlarge the conversation and integrate the thinking into financial systems and global markets. Together, we can make faster progress as we work to end the COVID-19 pandemic and build a more stable, peaceful and prosperous world for all. Thank you. Secretary General for that contribution. Now I want to hand over to the President of PACT, Caroline Anstey, to host this part of our conversation. Caroline. Thank you, Adrian. Um, and let me say I'm, I'm honored and, and absolutely delighted to have this opportunity to invite His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales to give his perspectives on why this reset is, is so important. Let me just say, and I think I think we're all well aware His Royal Highness has spent the last, well, I've heard him say the last 30 years, I actually think it's more like the last 45 or 50 years, uh, dedicating his efforts to really putting people and planet at the center of global value creation. So I, it is a great honor, uh, Your Royal Highness, to hear from you now. And uh, let me, without further ado, hand over to you. Caroline, thank you very much indeed for, for your kind words. I, I think I have a feeling it's about 38 years now, probably, or something like that, that I've been trying. But um, a, these are unprecedented times. Every person on the planet has been impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. Our world came to a standstill and it became clear that we did not have the uh, answer or the mechanisms to address such an unprecedented global threat. The threats posed by this um, dreadful pandemic came upon us suddenly with very little warning. The threat of climate change has been more gradual, but uh, its devastating reality for many people and their livelihoods around the world and its ever greater potential to disrupt surpasses even that of COVID-19. In addition to COVID-19, over the last few decades, we have seen bird flu, swine flu, Ebola, MERS, SARS, which are all zoonotic diseases originating in animals. More than half of all pathogens affecting humans come from animals. Changing the relationship between wild, domestic and human animals makes pandemics more likely, which is why we need to restore balance with the natural world through decisive action on climate change and restoring biodiversity. If, um, if we look at the planet as if uh, it were a patient, uh, we can see that our activities have been damaging her immune system and she has been struggling to function and thrive due to the strain we have put on her vital organs. To treat her, we need to restore balance and put nature back at the center of the circle. And to achieve this, we must act for health and well-being, understand nature's patterns and cycles, recognize the value of diversity, unity, and the interdependence of all living things, consider the importance of innovation and adaptation, and invest uh, in nature-based solutions to help stimulate a more circular bioeconomy that gives back to nature as much as we take from her. Now, I can only hope that as this current crisis passes, we are able to reflect on and shape the type, type of world we want for ourselves and for future generations. The 75 years after the Second World War saw unprecedented growth, rising longevity and poverty reduction. But all this put an overwhelming strain on our environment. The good news is that we have many of the solutions to hand. Renewable energy is now cheaper than fossil fuels. Our agriculture and land use can be more resilient, healthy and productive if we do not degrade our land, destroy our forests 
and poison our water. Unfortunately, uh, we so often forget that we are profoundly dependent on nature for our lives and livelihood. So how do we balance the need to rebuild economic prosperity, the need to get people back to work against environmental concerns? Investing sustainably now can be a fast, efficient and attractive way to reboot our economy. Therefore, what should be the principles that underlie the reshaping of a new and better global economic system? To seize this uh, window of opportunity, I believe we need to do five things. First of all, to create momentum for the Great Reset, we need to capture the imagination and will of humanity. We will only change if we really want to change. Secondly, the global economic recovery must set us on a new trajectory of sustainable employment, of livelihoods and economic growth. To achieve scale, we must not be afraid to reorientate our long-standing incentive structures, which have been having such perverse effects on our planetary environment and on nature herself, if we are to reap the benefits afforded by a more sustainable world. Thirdly, we must redesign systems and pathways to advance net zero transitions globally. And in this regard, carbon pricing can form a critical pathway to genuinely sustainable markets. This reset moment is our opportunity to accelerate and align our efforts to create truly global momentum. Countries, industries, and businesses moving together can create efficiencies and economies of scale that will allow us to leapfrog our collective progress and accelerate our transition. Fourthly, we must reinvigorate science, technology, and innovation. This crisis has shown the importance of investing in science, technology, and innovation. We are on the verge of catalytic breakthroughs that will alter our view of what is possible and profitable within the framework of a sustainable future. And fifthly, we must rebalance investment. Accelerating sustainable investment could offer significant economic growth and employment opportunities, including in green energy, the regeneration of nature and landscapes, the circular bioeconomy, ecotourism, and green public infrastructure. It is time, therefore, to align sustainable solutions with funding in a way that can transform the marketplace. This would be the most dramatic act of responsible leadership ever seen by the global private sector and would at once provide a catalytic incentive for the public sector to follow. We have a golden opportunity to seize something good from this crisis. Its unprecedented shockwaves may well make people more receptive to big visions of change and global crises like pandemics and climate change know no borders and highlight just how interdependent we are as one people sharing one planet. Over the past month or so, despite the ongoing crisis, I've been encouraged to see the growing calls for a green recovery. We, start, we need only look to the United Nations Secretary General, to the IMF, uh, the EU, the Petersburg Climate Dialogue, the Canadian government, the COP26 universities network, and business leaders around the world to see this. And as we move from rescue to recovery, therefore we have a unique but rapidly shrinking window of opportunity to learn lessons and reset ourselves on a more sustainable path. It is an opportunity we have never had before and may never have again. So we must use all the levers we have at our disposal knowing that each and every one of us has a vital role to play. Everything I have tried to do and urge over the past 50 years has been done with our children and grandchildren in mind. So I can only encourage us all to think big and act now. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you very much, um, Your Royal Highness. And, and um, if I may, I, I want to come back to you at the at the end of this first session. But let me turn now to um, Kristalina Georgieva, um, Managing Director of the IMF. Um, His Royal Highness uh, concluded by saying, 
each and every one of us has a role to play. Um, you are now heading up an institution with over 190 members. Um, you've been on record as saying we shouldn't talk about build back better because we need to build forward. And we really need to bring together the kind of change, integrated change that His Royal Highness talked about. Christina, tell us what the Great Reset means to you uh, and what you will do about it. Well, thank you very much. And uh, from the bottom of my heart, uh, uh, many thanks to His Royal uh, Highness and to Professor Schwab for bringing us together. Uh, now is the time to think what history would say about this crisis. And now is the time for all of us to define our own role. Will history say that was the great reversal? And we actually today see very worrisome, worrisome uh, signs. Uh, 170 countries are going to uh, finish this year with a smaller economy than they started. And we already project that uh, there will be more debt, more deficit, more unemployment, and there is a very high risk of more inequality and more poverty unless we act. And that takes me to what is it that would make it so that history would look at this crisis as the great opportunity for reset. Uh, from, from the uh, perspective of the IMF, uh, what we see is uh, inevitably a very massive injection of fiscal stimulus to help countries deal with this crisis and shift gear for growth to return. But it is paramount that this growth leads to a greener, smarter, and more fairer world in the future. And it is possible to do that, provided that we concentrate on the um, key elements of a recovery now. We don't wait for the, for the days to come. Uh, for the fund, what we see uh, are tremendous opportunities. Let me first talk about the, uh, a green, green growth in the future. Uh, we can put in place public investments and incentives for private investments into low carbon and climate resilient growth. Not only that, but many of these investments can lead to job-rich recovery. Think of mangroves restoration, reforestation, or building insulation. And think of the key sectors for reducing uh, climate uh, uh, intensity, uh, where both the public and private sector can uh, invest. Uh, I'm particularly keen to take advantage of the low oil prices today to eliminate harmful subsidies and to bring in place carbon price as an incentive for the uh, investments uh, for the future. Uh, secondly, we know the digital economy is the big winner of this crisis. But if we allow it to drive further division in our world, in other words, countries and communities to fall further behind, then it is going to bring uh, uh, more pain than gain for the future. So it is critical, and we do, we at the fund uh, work with others to use investments that are going to be supported by institutions like mine, by the World Bank and others, to shrink the digital uh, divide uh, and also we need to think of how we are going to use the uh, benefits of rapid growth in digital where profitability is jumping up to build more of a sharing of these benefits across our societies. Uh, and that takes me to my third and, and I think most important 
point of a fairer world. Uh, we know that this pandemic uh, uh, is, uh, if left on its own devices, is going to deepen inequality. That has happened in prior cases of pandemic. But if we were to concentrate on investing in people, in the social fabric of our societies, in access to opportunities to education uh, to all, uh, in the uh, expansion of social uh, programs, so we take care of the most vulnerable people, then we can have a world that is a better world for all. And I want to, to conclude with an example from the past uh, William Beveridge, in the midst of the Second World War, put forward his famous report in 1942, in which he projected how the UK can address what he called the five giant evils. And that led to a better country after the world, and actually to the National Health Service that is saving so many lives today in the UK. And my institution was created exactly in this time. So we now have to step up, use all the strength we have in the case of the IMF, $1 trillion lending capacity and tremendous engagement on the policy side to turn a page, to have that history be about the great reset, not about the great reversal. And I want to say it loud and clear, the best memorial we can build for those who lost their lives to the pandemic is that greener, smarter, fairer world. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you very much, I... uh, Kristalina. Um, uh, we're, delighted, uh, we're delighted at those words, and I, I, I think they've provoked a lot of thinking. So. So thank you. Let me let me pass to Professor Klaus Schwab. Um, Klaus, you have talked about this is a this is a moment that can't be lost. Uh, as Kristalina said, we must turn the page. As His Royal Highness said, we will only change if we want to. What does the Great Reset mean to you? Uh, you've been working again on this agenda for many decades, and. And how is the World Economic Forum and Davos going to contribute to this, this game-changing moment? I think um, the most important issue is to change our mindsets. And instead of being uh, so much uh, focusing on short-termism as we did in the past, we have to keep in mind the long-term perspectives and the long-term prosperity. This leads me, for example, to the need, and the World Economic Forum is very much engaged, to elaborate a comprehensive uh, system of ESG, environmental, social, and good governance criteria for companies. It should be a must for companies to report, not only on financial success, but how they contribute to our environmental health, to social cohesion and exercise uh, good governance. That's only one aspect. So to, to, uh, to answer your question related to Davos, we will now start a quite a high number of task forces to look at all the different issues and we will present all those ideas to the people assembled in Davos, to the leaders from business and uh, from uh, the political community. But at the same time, we will make Davos very different, very open. Um, we will mobilize our 10,000 global shapers in over 400 cities around the world to organize a twin summit and to interact continuously with those assembled in Davos to ensure that we do not fall, uh, fall back to old recipes, but that we really look at forward-oriented solutions. Thank you, Klaus. And, and let me just uh, press you with one final question, which is, Klaus, what do you say to skeptics out there who might say, we need to go back to where we were because we need 
the engine to run maximum. If we, if we go for great reset, if we go for green growth, if we go for long-term value creation, it may be the expense of, of jobs or short-term productivity. What, what do you say to those, those people? My, my question to those people would be, what is the alternative? And what we are doing to a certain extent is a betrayal of the next generation. Um, if we do not act, if we don't take our responsibility in face of history. So my, uh, my response would be, um, instead of being cynical and uh, critical, why don't you come and you engage? We need all the forces. We need everybody on board. And this initiative will really uh, integrate everybody in the world who has a voice and uh, who has particularly an innovative proposal how to improve livelihood. Thank you. Thank you very much, Klaus. And I think we're going to hear about some of those uh, proposals and detail going forward. But let me just now, before we go to the second section, uh, bring in your Royal Highness to, to give us some reflections on, on what you've just heard. And you, and you outlined this five-part plan that I think is, is so aligned with where people want to go. But what do you take away from, from the discussion you just heard from Kristalina and, and Klaus? Well, if I may say so, I, I'm hugely grateful to um, the Secretary General, the United Nations Secretary General, and to Kristalina Georgieva for joining us on, on this occasion. It really is so good of them to give up their precious time. And I, I, I must say, I, I was so heartened to hear what uh, Kristalina was saying, having known her for quite a long time now, and uh, I know how how remarkable she is and how much experience she has in all these different fields. So, what she was saying made an enormous amount of sense to me, and the fact that she, with the, the IMF and the Secretary General of the United Nations, are taking these particular lines now and understand the need for the kind of action. Uh, and the fact that we have no alternative, as Klaus was saying, because that is the case, we have no alternative, because otherwise, unless we take the action necessary and we build uh, again in a greener and more sustainable and more inclusive way, then we will end up having more and more pandemics and more and more disasters from ever, ever accelerating global warming and climate change. So this is the one moment as, uh, as you've all been saying, when we have to, 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 to make uh, as much progress as we can. And, and again, if I may say so, this is after having spent, I don't know, whatever it is now, 38 years of my life trying to encourage corporate social and environmental responsibility. And it tended to be rather an uphill struggle for many years. Uh, we managed to recruit some people, but by no means the the majority of, of the private sector. Now, the private sector is, I think, at the heart of the key of how we actually do this in a better uh, a, a, and more sustainable way that recognizes the long-term requirements, recognizes, as Klaus was saying, the fact that we owe it to not only the next generation, but as uh, the First Nations people all around the world know to the seventh unborn generation. And this is uh, where I think the, the leadership of the, of the uh, private sector can make a, a, a terrific difference, particularly in helping to, to inspire the private, the public sector to, to support at the same time. So I, I mean, I, I can only pray that that we, we recognize the urgency of the situation and the fact that all of you have gathered here today at least is one indication of that. You have a huge experience and I know you can make a difference. So thank you for, for your involvement. Thank you, Your Royal Highness. And, and I know um, want to thank you on another, on another level because I know you and Klaus Schwab will be uh, sponsoring a series of great reset dialogues between now and the uh, January 21 annual meeting. And I hope that will help to, 
to really flesh out uh, some of the issues you and Kristalina and Klaus raised uh, around those aspects of your five point plan and their focus on uh, the moment, seizing the moment. So, so with that, um, Adrian, let me hand back to you now. Caroline, thank you very much indeed. And thanks to all of our contributors. And we're very pleased to have them staying with us through this conversation, uh, returning maps at the end, just to reflect on what we're gonna hear about. One of the most important parts of the Great Reset are the social and economic dimensions. And just to explore those, we have three contributions coming up. We have joining us Sharon Burrow, who's General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation. We have Chip Safer's Victoria Alonso Perez. And uh, the person I'm going to turn to first, Ajay Banger of uh, MasterCard, Chief Executive Officer of MasterCard. Ajay, what do we need to see from a business perspective to address this pressing social and economic need uh, for change that this pandemic has really laid bare? So first of all, thank you for having me and thank you for creating the opportunity for this dialogue. You know, I, I've been saying for a while that the world's problems fit on three sides of a triangle. That's the prism you should look through. We just talked about them. It's one versus many man versus nature, and the unfortunate foundation is long-term versus short-term. We just walked through all of those in what we just heard from His Royal Highness Kristalina and from Klaus. Uh, the pandemic has exacerbated one angle of that. I think no doubt has contributed to the very unfortunate circumstances in America right now around our country of the riots that you're seeing. You know, when you, as a company, we made a commitment, Adrian, some years ago to go after 500 million people to be brought in for financial inclusion by 2020. We did that and now we've upped it to a billion and added that we will bring in 50 million micro SMEs and 25 million women entrepreneurs, all part of that one versus many side of the triangle. The other one, the one about the climate and the man versus nature, we aren't directly as impactful on nature we tried to use our presence with consumers to say, what is it consumers understand? They don't understand carbon credits, but they understand the planting of trees. And so we said we plant 100 million trees by incentivizing consumers to behave in certain ways. Take the tube in London or a taxi as an example. Why am I saying all this? In the process of doing all this, we've come to two lessons, and that's the answer to your question from my perspective. The first, there is not enough money in government or philanthropy to make it possible to deal with the three sides of this triangle. You need private sector capital, private sector ingenuity, private sector technology, and private sector capabilities to come to the party. We have to make it part of our business model, which were those two examples I gave you of inclusion and climate. Second learning, you need enormous trust between the private sector and the public sector for this to actually work. That trust is hard to come by. What I have seen during the course of the pandemic is some light at the end of the tunnel on the trust. The private sector and governments are working and the, and the NGO sector are working really well together. Whether it's the therapeutic accelerator we launched with Gates and the Welcome Trust or the work I see on SMEs around the world or benefit distribution and the use of data and analytics for purposes of directing activity. I think this issue of bringing the private sector to the party and bringing it in a way that the trust between the private and the public sector come together, those are imperatives for us if we're gonna make real progress on moving the needle and seizing the opportunity uh, that we just heard about. Thanks, Ajay. Sharon, you heard there about the importance of that public-private trust um, and rebuilding that. And we're talking here also in the Great Reset about the need for a new social contract. How important is it that as part of that social <laughs> contract, people are delivered jobs that are purposeful and meaningful? Well, thank you, Adrian, and thank you, Klaus, and indeed, Your Royal Highness. Uh, I thought uh, Klaus introduced the need for a new social contract because this will build trust uh, very eloquently. And I thank Kristalina for the 
um, greener, smarter, fairer world because it fits right into this frame. There's no doubt that people and planet must be on an equal footing with economy. So uh, indeed, the, uh, the Prince's, uh, you know, ESG has come of age, but we have to put indeed environment and social measures on the same page. If you think about it, COVID-19 has starkly exposed the existing fault lines in our world. We had already income inequality that was fueling income, race, gender inequality. It was about despair. It was about anger. It was resulting in a distrust even of our uh, democracies, even of each other, I should say. And of course, you're seeing some of that anger spill over now around racial injustice before and again, it will come on income injustice. And of course, progress for women has stalled everywhere. We have a climate emergency, which we can't walk away from. There's no doubt that the very survival of the human race requires us to act. And of course, we have choices facing the best and worst of technology. And I was delighted Kristalina raised some of the inequalities, but we indeed need to look at this world with a lens of what will indeed make our world better. And of course, the West taken a huge uh, leadership on this. So in that context, we would say that while we are very supportive of the global act of solidarity, around a health crisis that has put human lives first. We can't ignore the impact on people's lives and jobs, jobs and jobs, income uh, support, of course, wages and income for the areas where we've seen the labour market break down. But if we don't have full employment at the centre of recovery and building resilience, then we will go back into the same spiral. We also need, of course, uh, job creation to go along with that and investment in enabling green infrastructure, in industry policy to help us shift the transition, a just transition on all these fronts. And of course, in care and, uh, and in eco uh, systems repair. We need income protection. We need minimum li living wages and incomes finally settled with indeed the business community accepting that social dialogue and collective bargaining help us share our wealth on top of that. If we walk away from health and safety, whether it's formal health systems or whether it's safety of people and their lives and the risk of biological hazards, if we don't see global standards, then again, we put our people at risk everywhere. And we can never again, we can never again allow our health, education, care systems to be underfunded. Yeah. We must indeed build equal economic participation. Sorry, we must build social protection. And I'll finish on this. Mm. If we don't build social protection for everybody, 37 billion is all it would take for five years of funding for the poorest countries for health and income protection. I know that Kristalina, I know many governments are on our side, but we need it to be funded. And we need to see that indeed transparency of government and of governance includes consultation with people. Finally, can I say on financing, we must build a system of financing that is sustainable. And you have others on this panel who can deal with those questions better than me but we must end the short-termism, whether it's about investment or our approach to debt, which is, after all, investment in the future. I thank Sarah. you. The Great Reset is a, a proper envelope to, uh, to deal with these questions, a new social contract. Sharon, thank you for that. Um, the burden, the economic burden of this health crisis is falling uh, very hard on younger generations. And I think Klaus at the beginning spoke about the need to recognize an intergenerational responsibility. I want to turn to a young Uruguayan entrepreneur, uh, founder and CEO of a company called Chip Safer, and also one of the forum's young global leaders, uh, Victoria Alonso Perez. Victoria, can you just give us a sense of what this great reset means for younger generations and how 
this process can give them a voice and how we can hold ourselves accountable to their needs as we look at the future. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I think that this is a, a great initiative that is very needed. Um, I believe that right now we are at an evolutionary point in our society in which we are realizing that the way in which uh, we used to act or make decisions was not sustainable at all. And some great champions of that, of that are the younger generation. We have seen uh, how the young generation is raising awareness and speaking up. And that is super important because it uh, gives awareness about the global challenges that the, the world is facing right now. And I think that we need to leverage on that and then also uh, have more social entrepreneurs, innovators, people that can really tackle those challenges with the appropriate solution. And I think that the younger generation is great for that uh, because they are full of passion and, uh, and they are seeing what the problems are and, and, and finding how to um, solve them. And I think that's uh, something very important is also uh, finding the, the right problem. You know, many times, we um, criticize some, some industries. Like for example, I work in the farming industry and I've been able to speak to a lot of farmers from various parts of the world, rich and poor. And uh, one thing that I noticed is they love the land, you know, they, they want to be more sustainable. The problem is many times they do not have the tools or they do not uh, have the knowledge on how to be more sustainable or they do not have the access to capital. And I think that that is a great point in which young entrepreneurs, especially for de from developing countries that are there and can see the right problem, can really step up and create solutions. And we are, I mean, my generation is also uh, very connected. Uh, we grew up with, with internet. So we, we are in a much connected world. We can collaborate as we are seeing right now in the uh, it, during these times, how colla open collaboration is super important and create uh, processes or technologies from the fourth industrial revolution that can really help us uh, make better choices. We, I think that we uh, need to demand from the companies, we need to demand from the governments, but we also need to create change. We not only have to demand change, but also create change. And for that technology, it's, it's extremely important to actually also help us in, in how to um, come up with the, the best solutions for, for, a, for a problem. And I think that, uh, of course, there will be um, um, a transition period in which we have to start making better decisions and change uh, the way that, that we think. But I think as we're seeing with, with my generation, the next generations are going to be uh, more aware and, and taking more of the, of the right choices. Thanks, Victoria. Ajay, you've uh, outlined some of the ambitious steps that you're taking as a business to address some of the needs that you've heard about from both Sharon and from Victoria. How much does the business sector need to start taking these ESG goals more seriously there's a lot of skepticism and cynicism even about uh the esg and how closely uh businesses will follow them do we need to really put ceos uh fingers to the flame a little on some of these goals does business need to get ahead of it before the public the global public loses confidence and loses faith yeah, I think that uh, what Klaus was referring to, which is an effort at the WEF around the, at the International Business Council to develop uh, objective measures that can be put into the way all of us report out, I think that's an outstanding way of doing it. Because you create transparency and you create a level playing field in how people speak about the importance of these. Uh, and by the way, you ensure that investors begin to pay attention to it as well. So I think this is a, it's a brilliant idea and I'm all very supportive of it. I would say one thing about cynicism, Adrian, the time for cynicism is a little behind us. And uh, the idea of looking ahead really uh, requires us to, to put cynicism away and start thinking about constructive participation. So you're welcome to have a point of view and you're welcome to have a discourse, but being an armchair critic is really not acceptable. And it's time to come to the table 
and make a difference. And I think that's the point that we all need to emphasize for each other. I think that's a great point, Ajay. And I think that's something all of our contributors today, and I'm sure everyone listening in feels very strongly uh, on. Um, I want to turn to our next section of conversation to pick up on another of the key points behind this great reset, which is the transition to a sustainable economy. And we're going to be joined for this by Ma Yun, who's chair of China's Green Finance Committee and a member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the People's Bank of China. Also with Juliana Rotic, who's a venture partner in Atlantica Ventures and is a Schwab Foundation social entrepreneur who built uh, Ushahidi org and brck.org um, and also to bernard looney who's the chief executive officer of, of bp um, and bernard you heard crystalina reference the opportunities that are provided by the the current low price of oil and the talk that we've heard of uh, a transition uh, being accelerated by the pandemic how does a company like yours play a part in making that transition work Adrian, thank you. And um, to Professor Schwab and His Royal Highness, um, you know, we at BP, we welcome this uh, great initiative. And, uh, and I would like to offer some thoughts on, uh, on the question you raise. Um, I think some people know in, in, uh, on February the 12th of this year, BP set out an ambition to become a net zero company by 2050 or sooner. And not just that, but actually to help the world get there. And um, I think a lot of people have asked Adrian if um, the pandemic has somehow um, uh, slowed our uh, energy in this area. And if anything, I think it's increased it. And we're as if not more committed than ever uh, to make that happen. Um, you know, we all know there is a carbon budget. It is finite. It is running out. But I think a, a better way to explain it might be some refinery workers that I, I was speaking to in the United States just a few weeks ago. And they thanked me for the commitment to the energy transition. And I asked them why. And one of them said, given the choice, I choose my grandchildren every time. And that was coming from someone who has worked uh, in hydrocarbons for his uh, career. So that is what this is uh, about. And uh, we have some thoughts on what uh, we think should happen. Obviously, it's against a backdrop uh, where growth and employment uh, is core and governments will be facing uh, higher deficits, higher debts. So we need to think about how we can do this at uh, low or no cost to the taxpayer and in, in some ways in, increase revenue. There are three policy points, Adrian, that, that we would just quickly touch on. Um, the first is um, that any recovery stimulus should have green conditions attached to it. Uh, Kristalina mentioned this. I agree with her 100%. We're seeing some of that here in Europe, and we absolutely encourage and actually advocate for that. Secondly, um, energy prices should reflect real costs. His Royal Highness talked about carbon price. Uh, Kristalina talked about abolishing subsidies for fossil fuel production. We agree with all of that, and in fact, we advocate strongly uh, for all of that. And then thirdly, um, supporting decarbonization in emerging economies. Uh, we want to make sure that in those countries, people are not forced to choose between uh, a clean energy and uh, supporting uh, jobs, as Sharon, Sharon uh, pointed out, supporting jobs and livelihoods. They shouldn't have to make uh, that choice. And, and building back better ought to be about closing the gaps that exist in inequality and social injustice rather than widening them. So. You know, just in closing, Adrian, I would say we need our imagination here. Um, we're seeing today, uh, every day, the art of the possible. The possible is being redefined each and every day right now. So the next time someone tells us uh, that tackling climate change is either too costly or too difficult, I think we need to remind them and remind ourselves of what just is happening right now. So that's where, uh, that's where we are at. Back to you, Adrian. Thanks very much, Bernard. And you mentioned some of the tough choices facing emerging economies. Well, someone who knows uh, all about that is Juliana Rotich. Juliana, you work um, with uh, social enterprise and in East Africa particularly. 
How do you see this reset working in terms of empowering people in those emerging economies and helping them to avoid some of the tough choices that Bernard was talking about? Thank you very much for um, uh, inviting me and including me in the conversation. Thank you to uh, Professor Klaus Schwab and um, the, uh, the Prince of Wales. Um, I'm joining you from Nairobi, and one of the things that this pandemic has um, exposed is that there are a lot more people um, and a lot of young people who are living in precarious uh, reality. So this has hit not only individuals, but also small businesses quite hard. Um, and it has also hit social entrepreneurs uh, who um, typically work with the most vulnerable. Um, but we've also seen social entrepreneurs step in in incredible ways. Um, there's a uh, woman who uh, used to run school uh, feeding programs in schools. And we've seen her work um, become even more important during this pandemic. Um, so from the ground, um, not only has it exposed the pre precarious reality, but then it has also exposed the opportunity to recenter the reset around the most vulnerable and those on the edge where um, it only takes something like a pandemic or um, difficult circumstances to slide into poverty. So there's been a lot of improvements over the last couple of years but a lot of those improvements will be wiped out if we're not if we if we reset in a way that does not um uh does not invest in young people to get them to a place where they feel like they can bounce forward and um the way we can do that is first of all just making sure that there is money in their pockets uh, to not only survive now, but to be able to continue to employ others. So for example, there, um, uh, some of the experts here in Kenya and other African countries um, estimate that more than 75% of small and medium enterprises may have a really difficult time. Some of them may actually shut down and that is extremely problematic. Um, so governments are do need to have a fund that they can put money directly into people's pockets and directly into SMEs so that those SMEs can continue to, to, to keep people employed. Thanks, Juliana. Um, you mentioned and, and Bernard mentioned um, the choices that we're facing as we as we look at this great reset. And I think probably no country embodies those choices uh, as well as China, where we're really looking at the Chinese economy as possibly providing the world with an engine forward out of the pandemic, but also looking at uh, how it uses the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution and the new greener technologies to help power that transition. Very pleased to have uh, Ma Yun on the line uh, with us. And can I just turn to you in your capacity as chair of China's Green Finance Committee and also in your role as an MPC member at the PBOC, just to get your perspective on how China will manage that transition and what we can expect. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, can you hear me okay? Very well. Great. Um, last couple of weeks, we've been discussing this topic of uh, green recovery or green stimulus package within the uh, Chinese Green Finance Committee. And we also had a conversations with uh, quite a few MDBs within the region, including ADB, AIB, and so on. Uh, one strong message that's emerging from these discussion is that uh, the recovery has to be greener than any of the previous recoveries. And in order to do that, we need to ensure that the stimulus package, including fiscal and monetary, are much greater uh, than they were before. Now, why we see a lot of urgency for ensuring this to happen, two reasons. One is that the size of the stimulus package, including fiscal and monetary, are very, very big. Um, in US, in some of the European countries, uh, amounts to 10 to 20% of GDP. In China, 
the fiscal stimulus measured by broadly defined fiscal deficit is about 8% of GDP. Uh, it's not as big as in the U.S., but it's much bigger than uh, the uh, historical numbers. So we cannot waste this opportunity um, to ensure that uh, the uh, very precious money that's raised from the next generation is spent on green and low carbon. And the other reason is that uh, uh, for many of these projects, especially infrastructure projects that the government will invest in, the carbon footprint is determined um, in the uh, design stage of the project. And these carbon footprints or environmental footprints will be lasting for a few decades. So it's critically important that we make sure that these projects are designed as green in the coming few years. Um, we came up with a couple of specific uh, recommendations for the governments uh, in China and also within the region. Um, these are the six. Number one, we need to make sure that the percentage of green projects in the total number of projects is higher than any time in history. Uh, for example, according to the Chinese green taxonomy, um, back a couple of years ago, maybe five, 10 years ago, 10% of the projects were green. And we want to make sure that uh, a much higher percentage, you know, maybe as high as 20% are green based on the taxonomy. And uh, a lot of economists have developed the taxonomy, including China, Europe. So for these countries and regions, we encourage them to report the greenness of the projects in the government pipeline so that the whole society can monitor the greenness of the government stimulus package. The second idea is that for those projects who cannot be labeled as green because they don't fall into the green taxonomy that includes, for example, clean energy, green building, uh, environmental remediation projects and so on, but uh, fall into maybe uh, manufacturing uh, in general. For these ones, we need to make sure that uh, they still um, follow strict environmental and climate standards uh, so that they don't do a lot of pollution and generate a lot of carbon uh, for future generations to spend money to fix. And uh, in order for that to happen, also we need to enhance transparency for these so-called non-green projects. And in China, uh, we expect the regulator, including the environmental ministry and financial regulator, to come up with a regulation by end of this year to ask for all listed companies and all bond issuers to release environmental information on a mandatory basis. Uh, if that's done, I think it will be very helpful uh, in ensuring the transparency of all major projects done by large companies. The third point is that uh, uh, consumption stimulus needs to be green as well. Uh, a lot of countries are giving subsidies for um, individuals um, and uh, uh, some of them are giving consumer coupons. So how do we make sure that uh, such spending is also greener than before? One idea is that uh, the government can um, put together a wide list of green consumer goods. For example, electric vehicles, energy efficient refrigerators, energy efficient air conditioners, LED light bulbs, and recycled papers. And these are the ones should be given the uh, preference on the list of consumer subsidies and consumer coupons. The fourth idea is that uh, the government's employment generation program needs to be green. What do we mean by that? Uh, in China, there are a lot of migrant workers uh, who have lost jobs recently and they stay at home on the farm. And uh, instead of paying them unemployment benefits and letting them to do nothing, we should ask them to plant trees and pay them money. I think that's a better way of utilizing money and making the planet greener. The fifth point is that the uh, governments should consider issuing green bonds as much as possible. A lot of governments mm -hmm. are doing green projects anyway, but they are not issuing yep. green bonds. And by doing the green bond issuance, it can not only uh, enhance the market participation because it encourages the private sector to, to join, but also uh, can make sure that the so-called green projects government investing are really green as the market will monitor them and they need to have transparency for the green bond market. And final point is that for those central banks uh, which are intending to use QE, they should be considering buying green bonds and uh, this will help the uh, development of the green bond market. Great. Mayun, thank you, thank, you, thank you so much for that. Um, we've got a very busy uh, end of our hour and 15. We are expecting uh, to hear from Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, from uh, Lord Stern, 
uh, on climate uh, issues. And we also want to come back, uh, try and squeeze in a question or two from all of you uh, and to hear from uh, Kristalina Georgieva and from Klaus. Um, I'm going to turn to the fourth industrial revolution. We've spoken about this great reset as really accelerating the uh, kind of changes we've seen uh, in the fourth industrial revolution or the predicted, in fact, by Klaus in the fourth industrial revolution, his book. Brad Smith, you've just uh, written your own book about some of the kind of changes we can expect. To what extent has the pandemic accelerated change? And to what extent perhaps has it been a break on some of the changes we might have seen? What's your perspective? Well, I think interestingly, the pandemic has clearly uh, you know, accelerated the adoption of digital technologies. Uh, as people needed to work from home or study from home or as governments needed to operate from home, uh, it was digital technology that they turned to uh, to sustain the continuity of society around the world. Uh, and you know, as people return to work, I think we can continue to expect digital technology and data you know, fundamentally to be the infrastructure for this decade and you know, for the great reset we're talking about here. Uh, I think the great opportunity we have is to put this technology to work in a way that is going to advance all the goals that everyone has been talking about today. Uh, I think that needs to start with what it will take to promote a more inclusive jobs and economic recovery. Uh, I think that means recognizing that broadband has become the electricity of the 21st century. We need to spread broadband technology more broadly. Uh, and then we need to couple that with new initiatives to equip more people with the digital skills they'll need, not just to have a tech job, but a job that is increasingly tech enabled in almost every part of the economy. And we need to do this in a way that remembers that there are more than a billion people on the planet that have some kind of disability, temporary or permanent. And so we need to ensure that all of this works for them. Uh, I think as we do that, there are a couple of other things that are really of paramount importance. We need to sustain people's trust. And that means protecting their privacy. It means protecting their security. Uh, it means that ensuring that these new technologies, especially artificial intelligence, are deployed responsibly around the world. Uh, I think we have the opportunity to recognize that data and technology more broadly are indispensable tools to solving almost any of the problems that we confront. Uh, and so when it comes to protecting people's fundamental rights, as we're seeing in the United States today, uh, you know, we've been focused for several years on using data to shine a light on disparities, for example, uh, between the practices of police on African Americans and Blacks in the United States in comparison to other populations. And that is, I just think, a slice of what we'll need to address around the world. And then finally, I think it's right that every part of this conversation recognize that in all probability, the greatest challenge of this great decade, a uh, great reset, the greatest opportunity this decade is around sustainability. Uh, you know, that's why we as a company committed that we'll be carbon negative by the year 2030. But I think what we really have the opportunity to do is unite the private sector, use digital technology to better measure scope one, two, and three emissions created in the building of products and empower consumers around the world. So when they make a choice about which product to purchase, they can see what was emitted in terms of the amount of carbon to create that product in the same way that they can read the nutritional content on a label at the grocery store of a food product. If we can empower consumers with all of this, I think we unleash this next generation to have a much broader impact more quickly. Brad, thanks so much. Um, obviously, underlying this uh, great reset is the crisis that the world has been facing now for decades, which is the climate crisis. And there are few people better positioned to comment on that than Nick Stern. Uh, Nick, welcome to this virtual meeting. Can you give us a perspective on the scale of the challenge that we face when we, the Great Reset is a very ambitious term, it's a very ambitious project. Do 
Is it up to the level of ambition that the world needs to tackle a crisis as big as the one you've outlined in climate change? Thank you very much, uh, Adrian. Thank, thank you, Your Royal Highness Klaus, for bringing us all together. Adrian, I'll try and answer your question by trying to integrate what we've heard today, to try to put the pieces together, because we have to change for uh, a serious response to the climate crisis. We have to change our economies dramatically in the next 20 or 30 years, and the next 10 years is absolutely decisive. If we are negligent in these next 10 years, if we don't move fast enough, then three degrees would uh, be beyond um, our capabilities, and that would be devastating, let alone two degrees. But let me try to put together what we've heard today, because I think that's the overall answer to your question about scale and how we can change. I like to think of it in terms of the different players and their behaviours and how they change, and the different actions and investments that we have to make, and how we design and evaluate those um, uh, actions, investments, changes. I think it helps to think of individuals and communities, firms, governments and the states, the third sector, if you like, the labor movement, uh, faith, NGOs, and finally international institutions. The last two we've heard eloquently from my friends, uh, uh, Sharon and Kristalina, about uh, labor movements, about international organizations. I think individuals and communities, we've seen um, our common humanity emphasized and brought together in these last months of the COVID crisis. We've seen young people looking after old people, notwithstanding that their education, their lives, their training have been so disrupted. So individuals and communities are stepping up. Firms, I think, are beginning to step up, and we've heard it today, and that has to accelerate. I think we have to understand the ESG not as an add-on, rather we have to understand the purpose of the firm as finding profitable solutions to the problems of people and planet. The first word there really of substance is profitable, but we have to breathe to live, but breathing is not the purpose of life. So finding profitable solutions to problems of the people and the planet, and we're starting to see firms move to that, and we're seeing firms that behave responsibly in that way, actually doing better on conventional measures of profitability and, in t and doing better in this particular period. So those are the actors and the players and how they can change and react to each other in different ways. What do we have to do? And here's the answer to the uh, climate question, sustainability. We have to invest strongly in the right kind of assets the right kind of physical assets, sustainable infrastructure, including, of course, energy, as we've heard, in human capital, in people and the skills that we need for these new economies, particularly looking uh, after the young people who risk being a lost generation here. And natural capital, fundamental if we're going to have a strong, healthy uh, biosystem, but also, of course, to the negative uh, emissions that we have to create, trees, land, restoration, oceans, and so on. And finally, the social capital is of fundamental importance. How we support and our, what is our confidence in uh, institutions, what is our sense of community, and taking on the problems of inequality. If we invest well in those four assets, we have something that is a really strong response to the challenge of sustainability in terms of the assets we create for the next generation. And of course, the technology for each of these capital, the technology of how we put it all together will be fundamental. Let's assess those against the values we've agreed in the sustainable development goals. And if we do these things, then we will have a sustainable recovery, which is a very strong recovery. Fast, labor intensive, big multiplier, just what Keynes would have liked if we look after retrofitting and buildings, trees and so on. And we'll find a transformation that is enormously attractive. Good idea to have cities where you can move and breathe, ecosystems which are robust and fruitful, and protect ourselves against uh, the climate change that we would otherwise create. So this is a story of hope and vision and practicality and delivery. And we can do all these things. And I'm enormously grateful to His Royal Highness and to Klaus for their leadership in taking us forward. Thank you.
Nick, thank you very much. Um, we've tried to get in some questions. I think uh, given the time and getting all our fantastic contributions in, it's, uh, it's proved uh, pretty difficult. But I think we have uh, Fika Sebesma on the line, who is honorary chairman of DSM and also a special envoy on COVID-19. Uh, Fika, I think we've got time for a very brief intervention from you from our, amongst our 600 plus audience. I appreciate it and thanks for all the comments and uh, Klaus Schwab and uh, His Royal Highness, uh, highly appreciate. Uh, I cannot agree more with all the statements made uh, during this call. Uh, and I think we have uh, a litmus test uh, in providing the world for the solutions of COVID for the Great Reset. Uh, what I've seen so far with the um, uh, aggressive actions of all countries separately on mouse mask, on tests, even on vaccines, is not very uh, uh, promising for how we deal with other cross-bordering uh, subjects. So I only hope uh, that we will address climate change and other things uh, with more collaborative spirit uh, as the WEF is standing for. Fika, thank you so much for that. Um, Time, I think we have to go back to just catch up with uh, our contributors at the very beginning of, of this call. Kristalina, uh, if we have you on the line, we'd just like your kind of closing reflections after what I think everyone would agree was a fantastically passionate uh, opening. Uh, well, it is uplifting to listen to all. And uh, I take from this uh, a very clear sense uh, that um, action now would determine the world of tomorrow. And I want to finish by saying, for my institution, we lean forward with everything we have towards this more sustainable and more inclusive uh, world, more resilient world of tomorrow. Thank you all. It was just great to be a part of this conversation. Kristalina, thanks so much. And I just want to turn for some closing thoughts to the person who uh, can, helped conceive this uh, initiative, uh, Professor Klaus Schwab. Klaus. Today um, is the beginning of uh, a global mobilization effort uh, to rally our forces behind this great reset initiative. And we have seen all the support during this session. We do not want to do just patchwork on our old system. It's not enough to change a few policies to address uh, short-term issues. What we need is a change of mindsets. It came out in the discussion of business models, of lifestyles, in order to achieve a more cohesive, more collaborative, more resilient uh, world. It must be a comprehensive approach to shape the future, integrating all organization and people with innovative ideas. And we have seen many ideas during the last hour. Our role at the World Economic Forum is to act as an independent and impartial platform, open to all stakeholders. We want to mobilize any organization, any person in the world. It's not a just one-off event what we are doing. I think it's a process. It's a process which integrates many facets, contributions from um, the governments, the international organizations, uh, business uh, companies, the young generation. Uh, for example, um, we are running this week the Ocean Summit, which will uh, be an essential element with tens of thousands of uh, participants. We have the Sustainable Markets Dialogue under the leadership of His Royal Highness and myself, which will convene on a regular basis. And the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum in January 21, which will serve as a global summit devoted to the Great Reset. This summit will bring the decision makers physically to Davos. But it will be interconnected with a virtual twin summit driven by the young generation, our global shapers. They will integrate over 400 hubs into the dialogue of Davos and ensure that the Global Reset Initiative 
is really forward looking and takes into account the voices of all who are left behind. I'm mindful and I may close with that. When I stood 21 years ago together with uh, Nelson Mandela uh, in Davos on the stage, and when he said, we should lay the scorch of racism, of divisiveness to rest. This requires strong democratic institution and the will of everybody and the culture of compassion. None of this is possible without a strong economy and a cohesive society. I would like to thank again the Prince of Wales, uh, Secretary General Guterres, Director General Georgieva, and all you panelists for launching uh, this great reset initiative. It's a tremendous responsibility which we have. So there is no other way. We have to live up to the expectations which we have created and we will do so. Thank you very much for joining this important great reset initiative launch. Thanks to everyone for being part of this call. Uh, thanks to all of our panelists. Thank you online for watching. And if you want more information on how to join and be involved, we have a video coming up that will have the details. Thanks again from Geneva. Thank you.